Uh, guten Morgen, uh, ich heiße Bill Patrick. Es gab eine Zeit, in der ich Deutsch gesprochen habe. Aber leider habe ich ganze Menge vergessen. Jetzt bin ich die andere meisten Amerikaner. Aber zumindest bin ich aus Kalifornien. Also bitte ich um Erlaubnis, meinen Vortrag auf Englisch zu halten. Although I have been to many places in Germany before, uh, this is my first time in Berlin. Berlin is a place that we in the United States are fascinated with. Yes, it's one of the great capitals of the world. It's a place of deep historical importance for everyone. Yet, there's this crazy amount of avant-garde creativity. And this combination of history and creativity uh, shouldn't be surprising. Yes, if a culture is not creative, then it will die, and it will have a short history. It might even be forgotten. And for all societies, being forgotten is probably the worst fate. A culture can't be creative if it's cut off from its past. There is a German philosopher, yes, Hans Georg Gadamer, who has written that understanding takes place in a constant dialogue between the past and the present. To deny us meaningful access to the past, then, is to deny us our ability to become who we are now. So the celebrations last Sunday um, at the Berliner Mauer uh, certainly make this point far better than any speech could, just by being there. The British, who I think are far better writers and historians than we Americans are, uh, have undertaken this sort of study of creativity in Germany um, with their sort of usual enthusiasm and, and thoroughness. Um, there is a uh, exhibition going on right now at the British Museum called Germany Memories of a Nation. Yes, and the museum director uh, Mr. McGregor, has a 30-part series right, on 600 years of German creativity. Right? It's, it's an amazing uh, series. So of, uh, well, I'll do the first one. Of the many works in the exhibition, I want to show you my favorite. Most of you will know this, yes? This is by Gerhard Richter, right? So in 1977, he uh, did a portrait of his daughter, Betty. And then in 1988, he took this photograph, right? So in this photograph, which I think is his most compelling portrait of all of his works, um, Betty is looking back at one of Richter's own gray paintings, right? So she's looking away from the viewer. She's looking away from Richter. She is simultaneously in the present while she's looking at the past, right? She's looking at uh, her past with her father, yes? And by extension, for those who are parents like me, she, it raises the question of uh, our kids and what they become when they become adults. It's a very sort of emotional, at least for me, uh, issue. So this realization that our pasts and our futures are one um, is an ancient one. And Richter is not the first to do it, although he did it very beautifully. Um, there is, I want to give you an illustration of this. So we'll, we'll do the second one now. Um, I want to show you how the past and the present can be visually connected. So this is a page from the Talmud. It's a colored page. It didn't, it's not originally that way. It's originally in black and white. But it's colored here to illustrate what's in it. Yes, the pink part there in the middle on the top um, is what's called the Mishnah. And that was a summary of Jewish law that was written between 180 CE, common era, and 220 CE, and it's written in Hebrew. 
The yellow text there below it, in the middle, right, is what's called the Gemara, and that was published about 500 common era, and it's written in a mix of Aramaic uh, and Hebrew, Aramaic having been you know, the sort of common speaking language at the time. Um, together, these two make up the Talmud, right? The Talmud is those two combined. And Talmud means instruction or learning. Okay, now on the right side there, in the blue, which sort of goes all, all the way around that, yes, that is commentary on the Talmud by a French medieval scholar called Rashi. Um, then there is further commentary around that in green, right? That is by later commentators. So one of the uh, great benefits of digital technology, of course, is that you can link. Uh, this particular colored version is from a BBC article. And if you link onto any of those colors, it's going to give you an explanation of what it is. Uh, but that just merely says, you know, the Gemara was written here, or Rashi was here or that. Uh, in other versions, you can, you know, link to further scholars, you can link to translations, to original biblical sources, biographical material, anything that anybody has, except, of course, it has to be in digital form. <laughs> it's not in digital form, you can't link to it. This particular page is actually the very beginning of the Talmud. It's from the uh, tractate uh, Brachot. So up at the very top, there um, in the middle, it says, Me'etai, Me'etai, Korin, Et Shema, Bahava, Ravin, which means, from what time in the evening can we say the Shema prayer? That's sort of the question that begins the Talmud. When can we say that? So the Gemara, the yellow part there, um, then takes this topic up. Yes, the, in pink, it asks the question, and then in the yellow, uh, the issue is taken up. So there's a short answer. It starts with a question, it gives you a short answer. Then there's discussions, there's stories, there are dissenting views. You know, it, it can go wild places, things that seemingly have no connection to it at all. And then the page here um, gives you sort of a kaleidoscopic uh, look at how other people have answered these questions. So the beauty of this particular layout, of course, is that the associations that you make about what's being discussed are both textual, because this is a text, but it's also visual, because you have in one place, yes, all of these different discussions and, and uh, views about that question. And the sort of physical layout of this as a text um, mirrors the content of what's being discussed really quite perfectly, because the Gemara itself, the, the pink and the yellow, um, consists of these intergenerational discussions among rabbis who lived over a period of 600 years, right? This, is, this was originally an oral work, an oral work that took place over 600 years, right? And the discussions aren't chronological. I mean, you can read it now, and you know, this person says this, this person says that, but it's not chronological in the least. You have conversations between people who lived at totally different times. You have conversations with people who lived in different places and who never knew each other. Right? It's, but it takes place as if they did know each other, as if they are talking to each other at the same time. And that's not sloppiness. Um, it was done out of a belief that learning is intergenerational, right? That it occurs across different cultures. It occurs in different places, and it's not bound by time. It's not bound by where you are. It's organic. It's dynamic, right? It's the way that we want to live our lives. Um, there, one of my favorite writers, aside from Kafka, um, is uh, the Argentine writer and librarian, you have to mention that as well, uh, Jorge Luis Borges. So he had this beautiful metaphor. He said that when writers die, they become books, which is, after all, he thought, not a bad incarnation, right? If you believe in incarnation, to be incarnated as a book if you were a writer is a pretty great thing. So the, the Talmud is not a dead work. 
Yes, we have it here. But every day of every year, throughout the world, there are hundreds of thousands of people in dozens of countries who don't know each other, who don't speak each other's languages, who study and debate the exact same page of the Talmud every day. Yes? So imagine you're in Germany, there's someone in Israel, someone in the United States, Canada, Norway, and they're studying Talmud, and everyone is doing the same page every day. This is called Daf Yomi, right? Daf being page, Yomi being day. Um, and people sit down and they study it a bit every day. And then you finish that page and you flip and you go to the next page. And then you get to the end and it takes you seven and a half years. It's a big book, <laughs> many volumes. Seven and a half years it takes to do each individual page in this program. And when you get to the end of those seven and a half years, you start again <laughs> and you never stop. You just keep going. Now, what does this say to the mission of libraries and for our conference? Libraries try to give life, give access, to give meaning to all authors, not just those who are around now. Um, Mr. Yosef you know, had uh, the results from 1500s, from the 1800s, from the 1700s, and the goal of his library and all libraries is to give access to all authors, not just those who are around now. Um, and when you do that, the access should be, I think, like the Talmud. It should be an open page, yes, where you can absorb learning wherever that learning occurred. It doesn't matter what year it is, doesn't matter what place it is, doesn't matter who it is. You want to have access to that. And that's a critical thing. I, I had the opinion before that the worst thing is for a society to be forgotten. So, the Talmud, which was an oral work, it was intended to be oral. Uh, there was a belief that if it was oral, it could continue to organically grow. Yes? And so that was the original structure. But there was a realization that um, Jews would be dispersed from the land of Israel, uh, had been dispersed once already, and that that dispersal would be for centuries, if not forever. So, contrary to the original uh, intent of the Talmud, it was what you'd call redacted. It was written down. And it was written down, though, so that the learning would never be forgotten, so that you would exist as a society. So, having written it down and giving access to it is, many people believe, responsible for Jewish learning and Jewish civil society to exist now. So outside of this example here of the, of, uh, the Talmud, um, how do you combine a living past to a living present? You can't do that, I think, if you're limited to books from the last 20 years, if you're limited to books that were born, as Roger said, in digital form, right? The vast majority of our culture, and I would imagine the vast majority of works in the Norwegian collection, um, began life in analog form. So in 2010, Google said, how many books have ever been published? It's a nice question, it's a good research question, yes? So, you know, you can define book in many different ways and so you'll get different numbers depending upon what your definition is. Um, under our definition, there have been 130 million books published. Of those, we have indexed 25 million, right? Of those 25 million, 20 million were born in analog form. So, what that means um, is that only 5 million books were born digitally and that could easily, therefore, be indexed and searched. But that only represents 1 26th of the books that have been published, right? And those figures are limited to books. Uh, Roger did a wonderful job of, of talking about uh, all the different sort of cultural works that are out there, you know, film, radio, broadcast, and others. Now, how do you figure out how to get access to the other 25? There, you have a choice. You know, the choice is you don't do it, or you index it, and you index it the way that Roger described. That's the choice that everybody has. And 
Google's uh, choice was to provide access. Uh, Roger also mentioned that there is a question, of course, about how authors feel about this. So I, I want to give you my own experience because um, I've written a number of books and um, my own way of writing has changed rather dramatically. So my experience with this, when I was a, a law student um, in 1980, the founders of Google were seven years old at the time, right? And I was doing research in our law library. Okay, I love libraries. Um, I've worked at the Library of Congress for four and a half years. And when you work at a library, you can go behind the scenes. You can go into the stacks. You can go rummage around on the books. And I love that. And you know, old books actually have a smell, have an odor. I even like that. Um, one of my favorites is a book that was given to me. This book was published in 1768. Um, it's a very famous book in copyright history. Uh, Auf Deutsch ist die Jahreszeiten, the, the seasons. Those of you who like classical music and Joseph Haydn will know his oratorio, which was based on this English language book, which Baron von Sweeten uh, copied from, made an unauthorized derivative work, and gave it to Haydn, and that became his oratorio. But those of you who know the history of the copyright wars in England, uh, know it as the basis for Donaldson v. Beckett, Millar v. Taylor, the, the first copyright wars, the first 30-year war, um, and, and this was the book that was at the heart of that, and you know, I'm very happy to have a copy of that. But in 1980, when I was a law student, we had a law library, it was a wonderful library, but it was only law books. The, the books on law were only written by lawyers or judges. That was it. So I thought, okay, well, if I want to write about law, this is where I go. I go to the law library, right? That makes, sort of makes sense. But the only books there were law books. Now, as it turns out, this will be no surprise to any of you, but it was a surprise to law students like me. There are people who aren't lawyers who write really intelligently and thoroughly about legal subjects. You know? And many times, maybe most of the time, they're far better writers than lawyers are. Um, they actually know their subject. So how do you get access to that? How do you know they're there? You can't have access to something unless you know it's there. And in the physical world, you don't know it's there unless someone tells you it's there. The beauty of what happens with the digitization is that we no longer live inside that walled area where law students only go to law libraries and that's all that they know. Uh, I have an Italian friend, Eleonora Rosati, who has, works in this blog called the IP Cat, for those of you who know it. Her mother grew up in a small Tuscan village. She was an avid reader as a girl, but there are no libraries in her area. There are no bookstores in her area. And she was a small girl, so she was limited to a traveling library that came on wheels once a month. That was it. <laughs> that was her access to knowledge. We don't have to live that way anymore. You know? We can live with access to far greater knowledge. We have to learn from our ability to get outside of those walls. Now, uh, I'll, I'll give you one more uh, sort of anecdote about what this means for authors. Too often the debates uh, about digitization are between authors on one side or publishers and a consuming public on the other. And it's a, it's a, it's a polarized debate. Yes, it's them versus us, which is you know, really a helpful one. So uh, my first book was written in 1985 and it was on fair use topic. There was no World Wide Web in 1985. My book was in analog form. Um, one day, a number of years later, somebody asked me for a copy of it. I didn't have one. I called up the publisher and asked for a copy, and they said, we, well, they used the word pulped, <laughs> destroyed. <laughs> yes, they destroyed them. I said, well, why did you do that? <laughs> you know, why didn't, you know, I would have taken the copies, you know, maybe I would have tried to uh, give them away to friends and family or whatever, but I at least would have liked them. And they said, well, we're not a print. 
and when it goes out of print, we just destroy them. Now, under my contract with the publisher, when the book went out of print, the rights came back to me. So I then was the copyright owner of it. There may not have been many physical copies, but I owned the rights in the intangible one. A few years later, before I worked for Google, I discovered that the publisher had sent the book to Google to be indexed. They didn't own the rights. <laughs> I own the rights. I mean, how ironic is it? Yes, that, that uh, a book about fair use is given by a publisher who no longer owns the rights <laughs> to you know, a for-profit company to, to be indexed. Um, so I, I have to admit, I was surprised by that. <laughs> you know, having destroyed most of the copies, you know, they then you know, keep one copy and send it and give it off to Google. Um, but after I was not surprised anymore, I thought it was a good thing, right? More people would have had access to my book than before, and people would have been able to engage in uh, scanning, you know, in, in uh, full text of the search. Um, when I wrote my books after the Google Books project came along, I had access to all of those people who wrote in other disciplines who wrote in you know, the psychology of creativity, the economics of creativity. Um, and my book, hopefully, was a much better book for that. So in my view, my experience as an author is beneficial. We have um, far more access to more works. We can have better, better access. So I want to close here because the, the, the time is up. But yeah, I was asked about what's the status of the litigation Yes, of the Google project. What's, what's going on with that? Um, so here's, here's the status of it. Google was of the opinion that under US law, indexing of books to provide full text searching um, and the display of snippets of text in response to a search inquiry was fair use. Um, at the time those suits were brought, all the focus was on the scanning that was necessary for the indexing. Nobody complained, ever, about the display of snippets. Why? Because from the 1700s on, in England and then the United States, the display of quotations and short you know, segments of things has always been fair use. I mean, regardless of what you think about the project as a whole, the display of snippets has always been fair use under US law, right? Google was not breaking any new ground on that issue, in the least. So the question was rather, um, taking books to allow the indexing full text that Roger explained is actually necessary. Um, I think in this context of is that sort of indexing permissible under US law, I certainly have no opinion under foreign laws, um, it should be clear that all search engines copy the entire web every day. In fact, more than one time in the day, yes? Whether it's Google, Bing, Yandex, Baidu, the way every single search engine in the world works is by going and copying everything. <laughs> and you copy everything because you don't know what people want. As with the library, you want to be complete. You know, you don't want to have just a tiny bit. So that's the way all search engines work. They have to. And you either want search engines or you don't. And if you do want search engines, then you have to permit it, whether it's an implied license, whether it's copyright fair use, doesn't matter what you label it. The issue is whether you want to have a search engine, and if you do, then you have to permit it. So we actually have been successful on the original litigation. Uh, there is a final appeal that's being argued on December 3rd, but we've been successful, though it took us nine years and many, 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 many millions of dollars to get there. There was a settlement agreement, of course, which would have done other things, other things for authors. Um, that settlement agreement was successfully opposed, including by the German government. Um, but none of the opponents of the settlement agreement had a plan B. You know, I'm not saying anyone should have liked the settlement agreement. You, you may or you may not. You may have other ideas. But the lack of a plan B, the lack of someone else's alternative for it, killed that part of it. So all we're fighting about now is simply whether the original indexing for snippets was fair use. And we're, yeah, you know, I think we'll prevail on that. But if we prevail, you know, what happened? <laughs> you know, we didn't provide 
any more access. We didn't give a single euro to any author, right? The settlement agreement would have done that. Um, so, you know, winning is a vindication of sorts, but litigation is not a business model for anybody. And I think we can and should do better from that, right? Our laws have to match the reality of how the internet works, of how we learn, and how we want our libraries and museums to learn. And those laws have to be changed, I think, without regard to what they were in the past or what they are now. Because if we don't, then we're going to strangle the future. Yes. Why have laws that simply really don't match that? Um, and that's, that's really hard. It's certainly a difficult thing. But uh, last Sunday, Chancellor Merkel came and spoke at the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And I'll just conclude with a, a quote from her. Trauma können wir warten. Nichts muss so bleiben, wie es ist. Vielen Dank. Mm -hmm. <laughs>